This is Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, Chapter 11. Sometimes, while meditating on these things in solitude, I've got up in a sudden terror and put on my bonnet to go see how all was at the farm. I persuaded my conscience that it was a duty to warn him how people talked regarding his ways, and then I've recollected his confirmed bad habits and, hopeless of benefiting him, have flinched from re-entering the dismal house, doubting if I could bear to be taken at my word. One time I passed the old gate, going out of my way on a journey to Jimmerton. It was about the period that my narrative has reached. A bright frosty afternoon, the ground bare and the road hard and dry. I came to a stone where the highway branches off on the moor at your left hand. A rough sand pillar with the letters WH cut on its north side on the east, G, and on the southwest, TG. It serves as a guidepost to the grange, the heights, and village. The sun shone yellow on its gray head, reminding me of summer, and I cannot say why, but all at once a gush of child sensations flowed into my heart. Henley and I held it a favorite spot twenty years before. I gazed long at the weather-worn block, and stooping down, perceived a hole near the bottom still full of snail shells and pebbles, which we were fond of storing there with more perishable things. And as fresh as reality, it appeared that I beheld my early playmate seated on the withered turf, his dark square head bent forward, and his little hand scooping out the earth with a piece of slate. Poor Henley, I exclaimed involuntarily. I started. My bodily eye was cheated into a momentary belief that the child lifted its face and stared straight into mine. It vanished in a twinkling, but immediately I felt an irresistible yearning to be at the heights. Superstition urged me to comply with this impulse. Supposing he should be dead, I thought, or should die soon. Supposing it were a sign of death. The nearer I got to the house, the more agitated I grew, and on catching sight of it, I trembled in every limb. The apparition had outstripped me. It stood looking through the gate. That was my first idea on observing an elf-locked, brown-eyed boy setting his ruddy countenance against the bars. Further reflection suggested this must be Harriton, my Harriton, not altered greatly since I left him ten months since. "'God bless thee, darling,' I cried, forgetting instantaneously my foolish fears. "'Hareton, it's Nelly, Nelly, thy nurse.' He retreated out of arm's length and picked up a large flint. "'I am come to see thy father, Hareton,' I added, guessing from the action that Nelly, if she lived in his memory at all, was not recognized as one with me. He raised his missile to hurl it. I commenced a soothing speech, but could not stay his hand. The stone struck my bonnet, and it ensued from the stammering lips of the little fellow a string of curses which, whether he comprehended them or not, were delivered with practiced emphasis and distorted his baby features into a shocking expression of malignity. You may be certain this grieved more than angered me. Fit to cry, I took an orange from my pocket and offered it to propitiate him. He hesitated and snatched it from my hold as if he fancied I only intended to tempt and disappoint him. I showed another, keeping it out of his reach. Who has taught you those words, my bairn? I inquired. The curate? Damn the curate, Andy. Give me that, he replied. Tell us where you got your lessons and you shall have it, said I. Who's your master? Devil Daddy, was his answer. What do you learn from Daddy, I continued. He jumped at the fruit and I raised it higher. What does he teach you, I asked. Not, said he, but to keep out of his gate. Daddy cannot bide me because I swear at him. "'Ah, and the devil teaches you to swear at Daddy?' I observed. "'I... no,' he drawled. "'Who then?' "'Heathcliff.' I asked if he liked Mr. Heathcliff. "'Aye,' he answered again. Desiring to have his reasons for liking him, I could only gather the sentences. "'I note he pays his Daddy back for what he gives to me. "'He curses Daddy for cursing me. "'He say I must do as I will.' "'And the curate does not teach you to read and write, then?' I pursued. "'No, I was told the curate should have his teeth dashed down his throat.' If he stepped over the threshold, Heathcliff had promised that. I put the orange in his hand and bade him tell his father that a woman called Nellie Dean was waiting to speak with him by the garden gate. He went up the walk and entered the house, but instead of Henley, Heathcliff appeared on the door stones, and I turned directly and ran down the road as hard as I ever could race, making no halt till I gained the guidepost and feeling as scared as if I had raised a goblin. This is not much connected with Miss Isabella's affair, except that it urged me to resolve further on mounting vigilant guard and doing my utmost to cheat the spread of such bad influence at the Grange, even though I should wake a domestic storm by thwarting Mrs. Linton's pleasure. The next time Heathcliff came, my young lady chanced to be feeding some pigeons in the court. She had never spoken a word to her sister-in-law for three days, but she had likewise dropped her fretful complaining, and we found it a great comfort. Heathcliff had not the habit of bestowing a single unnecessary civility on Miss Linton, I knew, 
Now, as soon as he beheld her, his first precaution was to take a sweeping survey of the house front. I was standing by the kitchen window, but I drew out of sight. He then stepped across the pavement to her and said something. She seemed embarrassed and desirous of getting away. To prevent it, he laid his hand on her arm. She averted her face. He apparently put some question which she had no mind to answer. There was another rapid glance at the house, and supposing himself unseen, the scoundrel had the impudence to embrace her. "'Judas, traitor!' I ejaculated. "'You are a hypocrite, too, are you? A deliberate deceiver!' "'Who is Nellie?' said Catherine's voice at my elbow. I had been over-intent on watching the pair outside to mark her entrance. "'Your worthless friend,' I answered warmly. "'The sneaking rascal yonder. Ah, he has caught a glimpse of us. He is coming in. I wonder if he'll have the heart to find a plausible excuse for making love to Miss when he told you he hated her.' Mrs. Linton saw Isabella tear herself free and run into the garden, and a minute after Heathcliff opened the door. I couldn't withhold giving some loose to my indignation, but Catherine angrily insisted on silence and threatened to order me out of the kitchen if I dared to be so presumptuous as to put in my insolent tongue. To hear you, people might think you were the mistress, she cried. You want setting down in your right place. Heathcliff, what are you about raising this stir? I said you must let Isabella alone. I beg you will, unless you are tired of being received here and wish Linton to draw the bolts against you. "'God forbid that he should try,' answered the black villain. I detested him just then. "'God keep him meek and patient. Every day I grow madder after sending him to heaven.' "'Hush,' said Catherine, shutting the inner door. "'Don't vex me. Why have you disregarded my request? Did she come across you on purpose?' "'What is it to you?' he growled. "'I have a right to kiss her if she chooses, and you have no right to object. I am not your husband. You needn't be jealous of me.' I'm not jealous of you, replied the mistress. I'm jealous for you. Clear your face. You shan't scowl at me. If you like Isabella, you shall marry her. But if do you like her? Tell the truth, Heathcliff. There, you won't answer. I'm certain you don't. And would Mr. Linton approve of his sister marrying that man? I inquired. Mr. Linton should approve, returned my lady decisively. He might spare himself the trouble, said Heathcliff. I could do as well without his approbation. And as to you, Catherine, I have a mind to speak a few words now while we are at it. I want you to be aware that I know you have treated me infernally, infernally. Do you hear? And if you flatter yourself that I don't perceive it, you are a fool. And if you think I can be consoled by sweet words, you are an idiot. And if you fancy I'll suffer unrevenged, I'll convince you of the contrary in a very little while. Meantime, thank you for telling me your sister-in-law's secret. I swear I'll make the most of it and stand you aside. What new phase of his character is this? exclaimed Mrs. Linton in amazement. I've treated you infernally? And you'll take your revenge? How will you take it, ungrateful brute? How have I treated you infernally? I seek no revenge on you, replied Heathcliff, less vehemently. That's not the plan. The tyrant grinds down his slaves, and they don't turn against him. They crush those beneath them. You are welcome to torture me to death for your amusement. Only allow me to amuse myself a little in the same style, and refrain from insult as much as you are able. Having leveled my palace, don't erect a hovel and complacently admire your own charity in giving me that for a home. If I imagined you really wished me to marry Isabel, I'd cut my throat. Oh, the evil is that I am not jealous, is it? cried Catherine. Well, I won't repeat my offer of a wife. It is as bad as an offering Satan a lost soul. Your bliss lies like his in inflicting misery. You prove it. Edgar is restored from the ill temper he gave way to at your coming. I begin to be secure and tranquil, and you, restless to know us at peace, appear resolved on exciting a quarrel. Quarrel with Edgar, if you please, Heathcliff, and deceive his sister. You'll hit on exactly the most efficient method of revenging yourself on me. The conversation ceased. Mrs. Linton sat down by the fire, flushed and gloomy. The spirit which served her was growing intractable. She could neither lay nor control it. He stood on the hearth with folded arms, brooded on, brooding on his evil thoughts, and in this position I left him to seek the master, who was wondering what kept Catherine below so long. "'Ellen,' said he, when I entered, "'have you seen your mistress?' "'Yes, yeah, she's in the kitchen, sir,' I answered. "'She's sadly put out by Mr. Heathcliff's behavior, and indeed I do think it's time to arrange his visits on another footing. There's harm in being too soft, and now it's come to this.' And I related the scene in the court, and near as I dare, the whole subsequent dispute— I fancied it could not be very prejudicial to Mrs. Linton, unless she made it so afterwards, by assuming the defensive for her guest. Edgar Linton had difficulty in hearing me to the close. His first words revealed to him that he did not clear his wife of blame. This is insufferable, he exclaimed. It is disgraceful that she should own him for a friend and force his company on me. 
Call me two men out of the hall, Ellen. Catherine shall linger no longer to argue with the low ruffian. I have humored her enough. He descended and bidding the servants wait in the passage went, followed by me, to the kitchen. Its occupants had recommenced their angry discussion. Mrs. Linton, at least, was scolding with renewed vigor. Heathcliff had moved to the window and hung his head, somewhat cowed by her violent rating, apparently. He saw the master first and made a hasty motion that she should be silent, which she obeyed abruptly on discovering the reason of his intimation. "'How is this?' said Linton, addressing her. "'What notion of propriety must you have to remain here after the language which has been held to you by that black guard? "'I suppose, because it is ordinary talk, you think nothing of it. "'You are habituated to his baseness, and perhaps imagine I can get used to it, too.' "'Have you been listening at the door, Edgar?' asked the mistress, in tone particularly calculated to provoke her husband, "'implying both carelessness and contempt of his irritation.' Heathcliff, who had raised his eyes at the former speech, gave a sneering laugh at the latter. On purpose, it seemed, to draw Mr. Linton's attention to him. He succeeded, but Edgar did not mean to entertain him with any high flights of passion. "'I've been so far forbearing with you, sir,' he said quietly. "'Not that I was ignorant of your miserable, degrading character, but I felt you were only partly responsible for that. And Catherine, wishing to keep up your acquaintance, I acquiesced. Foolishly. Your presence is a moral poison that would contaminate the most virtuous.' For that cause, and to prevent worse consequences, I shall deny you hereafter admission into this house, and give notice now that I require your instant departure. Three minutes' delay will render it involuntary and ignominious. Heathcliff measured the height and breadth of the speaker with an eye full of derision. Cathy, this lamb of yours threatens like a bull, he said. It is in danger of splitting its skull against my knuckles. By God, Mr. Linton, I'm mortally sorry that you are not worth knocking down. My master glanced toward the passage and signed to me to fetch the men. He had no intention on hazarding a personal encounter. I obeyed the hint, but Mrs. Linton, suspecting something, followed, and when I attempted to call them, she pulled me back, slammed the door to, and locked it. Fair means, she said in answer to her husband's look of angry surprise. If you have not courage to attack him, make an apology or allow yourself to be beaten. It will correct you of feigning more valor than you possess. No, I'll swallow the key before you shall get it. I'm delightfully rewarded for my kindness to each. After constant indulgence of one's weak nature and the other's bad one, I earn for thanks two samples of blind ingratitude, stupid to absurdity. Edgar, I was defending you and yours. I wish Heathcliff may flog you sick for daring to think an evil thought of me. It did not need the medium of flogging to produce that effect on the master. He tried to wrest the key from Catherine's grasp, and for safety she flung it into the hottest part of the fire, whereupon Mr. Edgar was taken with a nervous trembling, and his countenance grew deadly pale. For his life, he could not avert that excessive emotion, and mingled anguish and humiliation overcame him completely. He leant back on the back of a chair and covered his face. "'Oh, heavens, in old days, this is your knighthood!' exclaimed Mrs. Linton. "'We are vanquished, we are vanquished. Heathcliff would as soon lift a finger at you as the king would march his army against a colony of mice.' Cheer up, you shan't be hurt. Your type is not a lamb, it's a sucking leveret. I wish you the joy of the milk-blooded coward, Cathy, said her friend. I compliment you on your taste. And that is the slavering, shivering thing you preferred to me? I would not strike him with my fist, but I'd kick him with my foot and experience considerable satisfaction. Is he weeping, or is he going to faint for fear? The fellow approached and gave the chair on which Linton rested a push. He better have kept his distance. My master quickly sprang erect and struck him full on the throat a blow that would have leveled a slighter man. He took his breath for a minute, and while he choked, Mr. Linton walked out by the back door into the yard and from thence to the front entrance. There, you've done with coming here, cried Catherine. Get away now. He'll return with a brace of pistols and half a dozen assistants. If he did overhear us, of course he'd never forgive you. You've played me an ill turn, Heathcliff. But go, make haste. I'd rather see Edgar at bay than you. Do you suppose I'm going with that blow burning in my gullet, he thundered? By hell, no. I'll crush his ribs like a rotten hazelnut before I cross the threshold. If I don't floor him now, I shall murder him sometime. So, as you value his existence, let me get at him. He is not coming, I interposed, framing a bit of a lie. There's a coachman and the two gardeners. You'll surely not wait to be thrust into the road by them. Each has a bludgeon, and Master will very likely be watching from the parlor windows to see that they fulfill his orders. The gardener and the coachman were there, but Linton was with them. They had already entered the court. Heathcliff, on second thoughts, resolved to avoid a struggle against three underlings. He seized the poker, smashed the lock from the inner door, and made his escape as they tramped in. 
Mrs. Linton, who was very much excited, bade me accompany her upstairs. She did not know my share in contributing to the disturbance, and I was anxious to keep her ignorance. I'm nearly distracted, Nellie, she exclaimed, throwing herself on the sofa. A thousand smith's hammers are beating in my head. Tell Isabella to shun me. This uproar is owing to her, and should she or anyone else aggravate my anger at present, I shall get wild. And Nellie, say to Edgar, if you see him again tonight, that I'm in danger of being seriously ill. I wish it may prove true. He has startled and distressed me shockingly. I want to frighten him. Besides, he might come and begin a string of abuse or complainings. I'm certain I should recriminate, and God knows where we should end. Will you do so, my good Nelly? You are aware that I am in no way blamable on this matter. What possessed him to turn listener? Heathcliff's talk was outrageous after you left us, but I could have soon have diverted him from Isabella, and the rest meant nothing. Now it was all dashed wrong by the fool's craving to hear evil of self that haunts some people like a demon. Had Edgar never, ga never gathered our conversation, he would never have been the worst for it. Really, when he opened on me that unreasonable tone of displeasure after I had scolded Heathcliff till I was hoarse for him, I did not care hardly what they did to each other, especially as I felt that, however the scene closed, we should all be driven asunder for nobody knows how long. Well, if I cannot keep Heathcliff for my friend, if Edgar will be mean and jealous, I'll try to break their hearts by breaking my own. That will be a prompt way of finishing all when I am pushed to extremity." but it's a deed to be reserved for a forlorn hope. I did not take Linton by surprise with it. To this point, he has been discreet and dreading to provoke me. He must represent the peril of quitting that policy and remind him of my passionate temper verging when kindled on frenzy. I wish you could dismiss that apathy out of that countenance and look rather more anxious about me. The stolidity with which I received these instructions was no doubt rather exasperating, for they were delivered in perfect sincerity but I believed a person who could plan the turning of her fits of passion to account beforehand might, by exerting her will, manage to control herself tolerably, even while under their influence. And I did not wish to frighten her husband, as she said, and multiply his annoyances for the purpose of serving her selfishness. Therefore, I said nothing when I met the master coming out towards the parlor, but I took the liberty of turning back to listen whether they would resume their quarrel together. He began to speak first. Remain where you are, Catherine he said, without any anger in his voice, but with much sorrowful despondency. I shall not stay. I am neither come to wrangle nor be reconciled, but I wish just to learn whether, after this evening events, you intend to continue your intimacy with... Oh, for mercy's sake, interrupted the mistress, stamping her foot. For mercy's sake, let us hear no more of it now. Your cold blood cannot be worked into a fever. Your veins are full of ice water, but mine are boiling, and the sight of such chillness makes them dance. To get rid of me, answer my question, persevered Mr. Lennon. You must answer it, and that violence does not alarm me. I have found that you can be as stoical as anyone when you please. Will you give up Heathcliff hereafter, or will you give up me? It is impossible for you to be my friend and his at the same time, and I absolutely require to know what you choose. I require to be left alone, exclaimed Catherine furiously. I demand it. Don't you see I can scarcely stand? Edgar, you, you leave me. She rang the bell till it broke with a twang. I entered leisurely. It was enough to try the temper of a saint, such senseless, wicked rages. There she lay, dashing her head against the arm of the sofa and grinding her teeth so that you might fancy she would crash them to splinters. Mr. Linton stood looking at her in sudden compunction and fear. He told me to fetch some water. She had no breath for speaking. I brought a glass full, and as she would not drink, I sprinkled it on her face. In a few seconds, she stretched herself out stiff and turned up her eyes while her cheeks at once blanched and livid assumed the aspect of death. Linton looked terrified. There's nothing in the world the matter, I whispered. I did not want him to yield, though I could not help being afraid in my heart. She has blood on her lips, he said, shuddering. Never mind, I answered tartly. And I told him how she had resolved previous to his coming on exhibiting a fit of frenzy. I incautiously gave the account aloud, and she heard me, for she started up, her hair flying over her shoulders, her eyes flashing, the muscles of her neck and arms standing out preternaturally. I made up my mind for broken bones, but she only glared about her for an instant, then rushed from the room. The master directed me to follow, and I did to her chamber door. She hindered me from going further by securing it against me. As she never offered to descend to breakfast the next morning, I went to ask whether she would have some carried up. No, she replied peremptorily. The same question was repeated at dinner and tea, and again on the morrow after, and received the same answer. Mr. Linton, on his part, spent his time in the library and did not inquire concerning his wife, wife's occupations. 
Isabella and he had had an hour's interview during which he tried to elicit from her some sentiment of proper horror for Heathcliff's advances, but he could make nothing of her evasive replies, was obliged to close the examination unsatisfactorily, adding, however, a solemn warning that if she were so insane as to encourage that worthless suitor, it would dissolve all bonds of relationship between herself and him.